Anza is here to tell us about her journey in life so far that it's all like I'm excited I'm buzzing at the thought of it because it's such an incredible story and I only know a snippet I've only scratched the surface in some of the things that I've heard but this is going to be a story of inspiration of I'm sure heartbreaking moments but then coming out the other end and one that is just of hope for others and in terms of her services that she offers and how she's gone into the world to like she's just said now break into booze but also offering the most incredible services to help people through their darkest moments answer is the ceo and founder of hope support services and we're going to link it in the description so that you can see the incredible services that they offer as a team and how integrated they are in terms of what they can bring to each and every person um so without further ado answer is um as i say the ceo and founder of hope support services she's an integrative counselor uh and training to become a consultant and a mother and a sister in islam mashallah um was there anything that i missed there (laughs) (laughs) slight miswording um i am a supervisor in the field as well and i'm a consultant who delivers training so not training to be a consultant i'm actually a consultant for training so and and, and most importantly a mother definitely yeah Yeah, thank you erin for that wonderful introduction no it's uh honestly as i said at the beginning before we recorded on (laughs) i am i i feel like i need some tissues (laughs) to prep us um but i'll have to grab some as well now don't get me started i know um, yeah do you want to take us back yeah i can um first of all bismillah rahman rahim and um, in the name of Allah, we start this uh, safe space and inshallah, may Allah give barakah, um to the words that we're going to be sharing today. And may it be a blessing and a, a reward for us, but also a message of hope to the people who are listening and watching today, to all my sisters out there. You know, whatever struggles you have, silent or out loud, you know, may Allah be there with you and, and know that Allah is with you throughout all of it. Um, I want to thank Nikita for reaching out and saying, you know, come along and share your story. I think we met on a a virtual platform and not too long ago. Um, You know, and I just heard a snippet of your story, Ansa, and I just thought, I didn't know anything about you. I just said, and you spoke for two minutes and I said, I want you on a podcast because (laughs) it's so inspirational, mashallah. Yeah. And this is not the first time I've done anything like this. I have done over the, the past years and I think my Weakness, if I can call it that, is that I've been doing things for many years, for nearly 15 years, and I don't shout about it. I'm not one to go out there and shout about it. And my team will say now over the last two years, you need to tell us about it. You need to shout about it more. And so I, I've been on British Muslim TV. I've been on um, Muslim Heritage Radio, Asian Fever Radio, been in the Asian Express tabloids and been on BBC One. So we've been on loads of places talking about um, my journey trying to get the word out there. Um, but I'll go back a little bit more and start at the beginning for you. So, as I said, I've been in this field for um, professionally for 15 years, but actually the journey starts longer than that. I've always been a person of, of passion and wanting to help others. So within my community, I was an active member, always trying to help others. For me, humanity prevails before anything else. So it, it didn't, for me, it was natural. It didn't, it wasn't like intentionally and maybe it should be always from an intention of wanting to do it from an Islamic perspective. But my aim was always to please Allah and help others, Allah's creations, regardless of what faith or background they are. So I held things like Asbo barbecues in my home mm-hmm. for and for kids who were really causing a, a havoc in the neighborhood to oh. understand them, get them to do a bit of gardening, do some barbecue yeah. for them, make some kebabs and pakoras and get chatting and understanding, hey, what's what's your deal? Why why are you going around smashing windows and why are you causing havoc? Um, and through that, I got to know my neighborhood better. I used to hold curry nights. So this was a bit of dawah. I used to invite the 40 houses on my street. So 20 across, 20 on my side. Oh. Did women's only, did a full mix as well. And this was to get rid of the hate crime because I moved into an area which was predominantly white. Um, this is in Leeds. I lived there. Um, 
and I really struggled um, to leave my house without having some abuse hurled at me for wearing a hijab, <laughs> being called all sorts of um, Islamophobic comments. Um, and when the ladies first came, I had no hijab. I think I had a hijab on, actually. Um, it was one of them, what was it, CK ones or something labeled like it was a, a fashionable one anyway. I thought it was nice. And one of these ladies turned around and said to me, oh, do you have to wear that dishcloth on your head? And I remember ripping it off in front of her and saying, is that what it looks like? Do you know how much I paid for this thing? Never wait that again. <laughs> I dealt with it like that, you know? And the second time, a few times, it got a bit more comfortable. I started letting everything, like, you know, when they come to my house, I wasn't fully covered. So they were like, oh, my God, are you allowed to dress like this? And I said, why can't I have my legs out and my arms out in my own home? <laughs> you know, yes. it's a women's only gathering and mm -hmm. want to make you feel comfortable, too. And it's about you being my guest and me making you feel comfortable so you don't feel out of place here. And and we loved it. We got to share. And that was my way of, of dealing with doing dawah and trying to connect with my community. And, you know, I lived there for, <laughs> oh, gosh, 14 years. And That's when I left... There were tears. My neighbors came out to see me. Those kids on the street, when I had no children, used to come and bake at my house. I used to invite them around. I used to do Eid parties every year. Every Christmas, I'd go to all the house and give them Christmas cards and gifts and Easter on, on Ramadan and Eid itself. So they, I became the auntie <laughs> in the street. And there was so much love from those children, you know, um, for me, that it really did fill that gap for me, that not being a mother physically in this dunya, that was really hurtful. But then I had all the children of the neighborhood that I became a, a second mom to, which really helped. Um, so that's bits of my journey. What was happening in terms of my work professionally separate at the time was, um, again, uh, a strong leadership role. I was an area manager for a high street bank, a really big high street bank. I was managing 15 branches in the area as a regional manager, working on conflict resolution, working with the retentions and customer service, again, being face front in and, and managing 3,000 people, that felt like nothing. I felt I had success in life. I had everything. But the one thing I really wanted was children. So in 2005, come 2006, there was lots of a test done for me and my husband at that time, who's now my ex-husband. <laughs> uh, we found out that I couldn't have children naturally. That's what the medical diagnosis was, that I'd need intervention. I suffer with PCOS and other complications at the now. Before then, I didn't only had that. So a year later, after much prayer, um, I need to back up a little and say that I actually broke down. I had a nervous breakdown as what I recognize now professionally when I got told I can't have children. That was like a earth shattering moment mm. for me. I had yeah. everything and that's the one thing I needed and I was being tested the most in. But I still trusted in God, um, my faith, my journey of faith became more stronger. I had the belief, I had the instinct, but you know, sometimes Allah, when we say Allah guides you and you may have the hikmah, you don't, but it's all about test of ultimate blind faith. I had the faith, but I didn't have the knowledge or the education into why I was feeling a certain thing or if I was doing something, how appropriate it was, or obviously it was appropriate. I found out afterwards, but obviously God, Allah SWT, was guiding me. <laughs> so then I kept praying and I don't believe in coincidences. I believe everything happens at the right time when it's meant to be. The date of when I found out I can't have children was the 20th of August. And exactly a year later, I went in to the doctors thinking I had breast cancer because I came out with a rash and lumps and I was really scared. I was really ill thinking, what's going on? This is not normal. They did all the tests and they ring me on the 20th of August, the following year, same date. Congratulations. You're pregnant, Mrs. Ahmed. So it hit me so hard. Um, I was so ecstatic. I was happy. Um, I've proven the doctors that I'm a medical marvel. <laughs> I've yeah, defeated yeah. their odds, right? <laughs> yeah. I can't get pregnant naturally. This must yeah. be sure it's my test results, mm. right? So anyway, found out I was pregnant. And subhanAllah, I was about 19 weeks and about four or five days. Um, I When I work at anything, Erin, I'm really dedicated so, you know, when I worked for the bank, I was really 110% behind it. I was with the team, even though they kept overlooking promotions and things like that. I should have been one of the directors a long time before, but it had got to that stage where they wasn't giving me everything. This was 10 years in. Mm -hmm. And when I had my miscarriage with my first, my first pregnancy, firstborn, 
Carrick, I named him. He was born sleeping at 19 weeks and seven days. So before leading up to that, I had pains and I had symptoms of the miscarriage, which I didn't recognize. So I had sharp shooting pains um, on my inner inner leg, in my back. Um, these were contractions or something wasn't right. The movements had got a bit more different and I wasn't advised. I didn't, I kept going back to the midwife and getting checked. When I'd contact my work and say to them, I can't come in, I'm not well, I need to go to the midwife. Uh, comments I would get is, well, if you can walk to the midwife appointment, you can certainly come to work. I remember that comment because that day was four days before I actually lost. So I went in to the doctors. I got transferred to the hospital straight away. Um, they did the scans. And while I was going to the appointment, my waters went. So at that point, I, I didn't understand what that meant mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. I, in my head, was adamant that this was a miracle pregnancy from Allah. Allah had given me this. Nobody's going to take it away. And I had lost trust and faith in the medical system because of them telling me I could never fall pregnant. And I did. Yes. So yeah. for me, I didn't believe yeah. anything they said anyway. Yeah. So for four days, I, I fought out with them. I was in hospital in the delivery suite and I refused to let them induce me. My baby's heartbeat was still there. He was still breathing. He was still alive as far as I was concerned. I feel like I should go back and give a bit of a trigger warning as well to say, you know, some of the things I share will be sensitive. So sisters, if you are listening and you're, you know, if find it too much, please do feel free to switch off the mic or go away and get a drink and come back. In the end, the infection that I was getting, the ill, how ill I was getting was more of a priority for the doctors. They said, if we do not do anything now, they had to force my, my father and my husband then to actually sign to say that they're okay to go ahead and medically intervene because oh, I was God. regarded as not in capacity. Um, I was distressed. Oh. I didn't realize how distressed I was. Um, so they did induce me. Oh. Um, it was horrendous. I remember them. Um, I'm, I had a lot of medical um, high risk factors to me. I, I've been to the death store four times. And that was the first time because they left after birth in me. It was too far gone past that point that they could get me to a theater. They'd left after birth inside me. So they had to go in manually. And I remember at that point, <laughs> The doctor saying, this is the female doctor saying, I've got small hands, don't worry. I absolutely, I just remember everything going white. And I remember passing out or whatever it was, but I couldn't, everything just like all the pain disappeared. And I felt myself as a sensation of floating is what I describe it as now. And I remember my name being called out by my husband then. And the doctors, my husband was screaming. The doctors were shouting my name and I came back and just felt this extreme pain and this extreme heaviness and sadness, this emptiness, that's the best way to describe it. And I just went silent. Up until that point, it was lots of crying. And at that point, it was just silence. When I got discharged, I remember leaving the hospital through the same lifts as the other parents carrying their babies. Oh. And I had a bag full of bloody clothes. That was the heartbreak point for oh. me. Um, I went into now what I recognize as... Um, a state of psychosis, not complete psychosis, but to a point where I couldn't function. I couldn't sleep properly. I was only knocking out for a couple of hours. I wasn't able to wash my hair. I didn't want to do anything. I was being moved around by my husband calling my sister or my mother to come to the house and he was trying to feed me. And this went on for about two weeks. My son was born on a Thursday and exactly the following Friday, two weeks on from that, I couldn't pray, obviously. And I, all I wanted to do was to talk to Allah and to pray. And I remember the weather had picked up and at this point I could see some sun gleaming through the blinds that were shut in my bedroom. And I had this teddy bear that I looked down at, which I'd put my baby's clothes on because up until this point, we'd got the nursery ready. We'd got baby's clothes. So I saw this teddy and I said, what are you doing? Answer? So this is not your baby. This is a teddy bear. Like this is not, I got angry at myself, right? Why are you not snapping out of it? You're an intelligent woman. I've just felt angry at myself. I threw this teddy down and I went down onto the floor and I opened all the blinds in front of me and I looked up into the sky and, and I just said, Ya Allah, a howling is what I call it, a howling from my empty womb to Allah. Why me? Why did you do this? Why did you give me a child and then take it away? Am I really not worthy? And if I am, tell me, will you give me, would you bless me with my son again? Yeah. And as I asked that question, the doorbell went downstairs. 
and I've not been to the door. I've not bothered with, you know, interacting with the dunya around me at this point. Yeah. I decided to get up and go downstairs and I opened the door. The husband's in the kitchen. He's starting to walk to the front as well. And as I opened the door, there were two midwives there, which I didn't see. I just saw two people with bright white light around them, intense white light around them. Hi, Miss Samed, we're here to wear your beautiful baby boy. And instantly in my heart, something like, you know, when you get that gut instinct, like something kicked out. And I don't remember this, but my husband tells me that I was crying and laughing at the same time. Yeah. But I do remember the words. I said to them, yes, you will come to my door and you will wear my son one day. Thank you. Yeah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar. I just kept saying, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar. And my husband's dragging me away from the door and he's shouting at the women. Give away, you, you, you silly women. My, my wife, my baby was, you know, lost. He couldn't speak much English and told them to go away. And I remember the community midwife coming, apologizing, crying in front of me. And I said, no. And I was, you know, as soon as they left, I sat down and then he shut the door and he tried to talk to me. And I didn't talk to him. I said, it's okay. Please make a cup of tea. And I ran upstairs, had a shower, sorted myself out, <laughs> came down back to normal. Absolutely. Like I'd snapped out of it and just. That simple second, right? And I told him, no, please don't put a complaint in. That was a message from my Lord. They were vessels through which Allah was applying to me. Five years later, fast forward, 11th of um, September, 2012, a nurse comes to my door and my son Mustafa is born and she's come to wear my son. This woman is shaking, she's crying. She sits at the end of my bed. I've had an emergency section. I can't move. She comes to the, the room and my baby's there. She's crying. And I grabbed her hand. I reached out and said, are you okay, sister? What's wrong? I thought somebody had maybe harassed her on the street, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was in the middle. You yeah. know, maybe it's the Beirut street that I live on. That's maybe a chapter <laughs> of it. You know, that's what I said. I'm really sorry if you've been harassed in any way. Telling my husband, oh, come back here in my own language. Make this poor woman a cup of tea. I think something's happened. Go check. <laughs> She's like, no, no, no. She goes, I don't think you remember me but I've never forgotten your door or your face oh. and your words. She goes, I was a student midwife who came with a senior midwife five years ago to your door by mistake. We were supposed to go to the street behind you and the midwife with me got it wrong. And I have never let that go that we'd come to your door by mistake, you know, that you'd lost your son. And I smiled. And I get goosebumps every time I tell this story, I smile. And I grabbed a hand and I said, give me your hand, my sister. And I said, do you know what, my sister, you've been carrying a burden for all these years. Mm. That was actually a blessing. And then I told her, I said, I want to tell you a little story. And I said, you know, this before you came to my door, I was speaking to my Lord. I was speaking to our Lord. And I said, I asked, will you ever give me my son again? Will I, am I worthy to, to be a mother? And when you answered, you were vessels through which Allah gave me my message back to reply to me. And look, look where you are, my sister. You sat here weighing my son today. You have come back to my door and you have come to wear my son. Yeah. And she got goosebumps. Yes. We both got goosebumps. And we <laughs> sat there and she was like, oh my God. She goes, that's amazing. She goes, and I said, she goes, I've never forgiven the midwife. And I said, no, it wasn't a mistake. There's never any mistakes. There's no coincidences. That was my Lord replying. And that gave me strength, that resilience. I mean, I lost many after Tariq. Um, the following year from that, I'd lost my daughter who was born. And she was, um, how many weeks was she? I was 22 or 23 weeks. She was born alive for 45 minutes. She died on my chest after 45 minutes. They, they refused to help in any way to take to antenatal because she was under the 24 weeks. So the law of this country is that you can abort up to 24 weeks gestation. So anything below that, they will not intervene. And oh. only, only 25 years prior to that, at that point, or 27, they would actually intervene. So the medical guidelines had changed and stuff because I have a neighbor next to me who was born at 22 weeks. Oh and my she had a son. Gosh. She oh. had survived. So, you know, um, I know that there's medical, <laughs> and that is seen as a medical exception. But um, I believe it, it, it's for a purpose, you know, and, and I went on to lose after Mustafa as well. I had my daughter, I mean, my son is now 10 years old. My daughter is five years old and she was born in 2017. And she's five now, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. Um, I lost after her as well. I lost in 2018, then I lost again, actually as recent as last year. 
So I have, um, you know, alhamdulillah, remarried again. Um, I have tried to move on and start my life. The, there's been good experiences and bad experiences in terms of the medical primary care that I had. There was yeah. no support in the community. My husband at that time, it was a very turbulent marriage. It was a test from Allah in terms yeah. of how we coped. But, you know, I really did suffer. And for me, every time I did this tahara for Allah to guide me and tell me if this, when there were issues going on, I always fell pregnant. So I took it as a sign from Allah that we should keep trying. We should keep working at this marriage, that I should keep trying. But when I lost, I saw it as a test of sabr. I didn't see it as, oh, we're not meant to be together. I kept mm -hmm. trying. And I always put the other person's feelings first, you know, be compassionate, be kind. The only reason my marriage actually in the end, even though I look back now and think of how abusive it was, and I recognized that, and I didn't speak up about it. And even the medical professionals, to be honest with you, didn't pick up on it because they just saw this intelligent, educated woman. How could she be in that sort of situation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was lots of things going on in terms mm. of honor was a factor, family connections were a factor, you know, how the domino effect, if if I broke off this marriage, which was an arranged marriage, by the way, mm. my initial marriage was an arranged one, and it was very difficult, um, but I could see that it was affecting my children. I think the children gave me a strength, mm. having my children, I could see how it was impacting them, mm. and also... I think the last time I did this Tahara, he came out with the words himself for divorce. And that was it from God. You know, that was a sign from God as well. Because you weren't going to do it so, because you were so, well, I was trying to time, do something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Committed to try and make it work. And oh, in the end, it got to a point where he'd given me to a talak and I'd got to a point where I couldn't take any more. And, mm. and my charity work was an issue as well. Cause I carried on doing a lot of charity work, a lot of, you know, I, I worked hard and provided. I was a main bread earner. Mm. Um, again, um, the doctors, I remember, would talk over me to him, assuming he's the educated one and he's the husband, when he couldn't understand a word they were saying. You know, I remember asking for a birthing mat for him to lay down on or, or, or sit on because he'd been stood for so long. Next to me, after our, our loss with Miriam, the second one, and we were told, well, surely he should be used to sleeping on the floor where he comes from. This is the kind of comments and the kind of service, lack of service we had. And I got passionate when I, I got passionately involved with my local um, trust, the hospital trust, the maternity care. We changed the pathways. I'm so proud of this. Just as a mm -hmm. as a service user mom at that point, I managed to change how they looked after women who lose their children and, and couples and families. So we have a separate entrance going to the delivery suite and there's a separate rooms for women who are going to lose their children. They're called the snowdrop suites in Leeds and they had them separately. So we had separate lifts to go down and the midwife, the bereavement midwife or any midwife at that time can come down and pick you up, receive you, as well as take you back down when you're leaving as well. So you're not alone. So we're really grateful. And also aftercare in terms of when you lose your baby, like to give the options of bathing your baby, doing gusel for your child if you have to, being able to take hand prints and footprints and things like that, trying to um, educate or inform, make more mm -hmm. awareness from a faith perspective, what's needed and what's allowed and what's not permitted. Yeah. Um, you know, even autopsies, for example, instead of cutting, um, and again, um, a trigger warning, it's really hard even if you have an adult has to go through that kind of mm -hmm. investigation but for a child it's even more hard it doesn't matter yeah. whether you come from a, a faith perspective or not so we managed to change if we can where possible to offer mris instead scans rather than the blade so there's lots of things like this where i got really actively involved and through that process i was involved with leeds university doing a a project on infant mortality and um, south asian and black african women and the high risk factors and i was one of the moms who decided to get involved at this point, I was reached out to and I'd had, um, I was either pregnant or was, I'd just had Mustafa. So then that work became really exciting. We actually, throughout that work, we presented at the National Midwifery Council over in Northern Ireland. We were paid for, flown out to Brilliant. Northern Ireland and presented to the National Midwifery Council about how we felt, what could be improved. I then got a sessional lecturer option to go work with some lecturers at the university to deliver to medical professionals what it felt like as a lived experience to have a medical professional not be sensitive to your needs and not be empathic and how compassion was mm -hmm. my key they needed more than knowledge you can't learn about everybody's culture it's not possible but to ask the question rather than assuming is the yes. key yeah that then gave me great motivation into sitting down with one of my 
a really good friend uh, and sister from another mother um, called Katie, who's the co-founder. I, I say to her, you're the co-founder. She goes, no, I'm not. It's your baby. And I went, no, no, we share this baby. And we <laughs> sat in her living room having tea. I remember this is going back years now, 2012. And, uh, and we met in Bosom Buddies, by the way. We were breastfeeding buddies. We were learning how to breastfeed and support other mothers. That was one of the, the things I got involved with after I had Mustafa. And she sat there and I said, oh, wow, there should be this available. There should be some support. And she'd miscarried herself as well. So we were talking about this and she was like, and so why don't you do it? You can do it. And I said, there should be a support group. There's great healing in that. Mm. Why is there nothing available for miscarriage mummies? And I wish I could do this. And I wish and she goes, you can do it. And then she got a laptop out and she created a website and she goes, there you go. Now you can announce it. And I went, oh my God, like, is it that easy? Um, so we registered with the voluntary action needs in, I think at the end of 2012, beginning of 2013 as a hope bereavement support. And I went out to ask for help financially and the answer wasn't good there was nobody wanted to know I even offered to work with my local trust and everybody else to say I'll come and do this tell me what I need to do and I want to help in any way but the walls were coming up for whatever reason I, 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 Allah Alam knows best yeah, why those yeah. reasons were there mm -hmm. but it actually those doors shutting down was taking me down a pathway which I didn't know at the time was to set mm. up something of my own so I did, in the end, carried on doing that for seven years, set, finding the locations myself, running the support groups myself and got the two people involved. We did our facilitation training in UK bereavement, child bereavement. We worked with them. I was training at the same time to become a counsellor myself. So I was going back to uni <laughs> part time and studying with babies throughout my miscarriages, still doing my part time study as well and working part time. And then finally, I, I set up my own private practice in 2015. I left the bank. And I never looked back, you know, reaching out to other VCSEs, other groups, helping, supporting, talking about mental health, talking about how it, it can be a massive stigma, you know, a massive taboo. And, and when the pandemic hit, mm. I reached out to all my peers, my colleagues on my social media saying, who's with me? Who wants to support me? I can't sit back and watch all this suffering and not help in any way as a qualified yeah. counsellor. And yeah. before I knew it, I had 30 people. And, and now at this point, we have just under 70 people right or just over of black and south asian different background different heritage as well as white different languages qualified counselors and coaches in our team and we managed and i never applied for funding in my life i managed to secure over 100 grand in my first year yes. and you know not that i'm trying my best to try it again but it's it's hard work and the funds have not always you know this is something that i'm learning in the third sector we are a community interest company we registered as a, as a community interest company um, in 2020. And during the pandemic, you had lots of support for grassroots organizations like ourselves. We are nationwide, we became nationwide. Um, we did all the online virtual support. We did our online conferences with international speakers two years in a run running now. And last year we ran um, a Light of Remembrance event, which was a walk from Millennium Square in Leeds all the way down to Mill Hill Chapel in the train station city center. We had both our member of parliaments turn up. We had a lot of the council cabinet members turn up as well. And we asked them really firmly, no political talk. We want you to share a personal experience of your loss. It's about marking the remembrance of loved ones lost in the pandemic that you couldn't mourn, that you couldn't speak about. And it was just wonderful having everybody to come together and we gave them all candles and we all walked down and we did a little bit of a memorial walk where there were different memorial spots we could stop at. We had the uh, Compassion Network there. We had um, Concord is another group that was there as well. That's interfaith group. So lots of different multiple faiths were there. And we had Sarah Yassina. I don't know if you heard of Sarah. Um, she came and, and sang mm. for us mm. from the Quran, verses of Surah Maryam, as well as some from the Bible as well. So she was really beautiful. Oh. And it was during Ramadan. So it was the 27th, I think the last 10 days. Shalom. So we all gave dates out. We opened a fast. We did a prayer. So oh. Imam Adam was there as well. Oh. Uh, Imam Adam did a bit of a talk and he's he's a young young blood really amazing little <laughs> mother and you know and everybody got to come up and and leave messages so we had a little little messages people could write and hang them up pin them up um say goodbye to their loved ones a bit of um I guess the little different closure techniques that we know of in the in the psychotherapy that can help in giving us that healing mm. in helping us to come together because there is great strength and I take this beautifully from our faith, you know, the word Ummah, it's about coming together. And for me, 
it's not just ummah of my brothers and sisters in Islam, it's ummah of my brothers and sisters in humanity. Mm -hmm. When we come together, when that energy comes together, especially yes. when you're hurting, there's a great healing in that. Yeah. And I've, I've sensed and experienced that and I could feel that in that room. And I was so proud of everybody who was there and how it helped, mm. you know, in connecting. Even if you said nothing, mm. you just felt connected and you felt mm. held and you felt safe. And, and it just felt, I can't describe it. It's indescribable, the feeling yeah. you have mm. when you come in a room full of people who are hurting and they're hurting the same as you, mm. you know that really makes a, a massive difference in connecting psychologically. So, well, that's my journey so far. There is more tests to come still, I believe. And I would not be here if it was not for, for the journey that I have been on. I would not be the person I am today. Yeah. I think I shared some pictures with you saying we were invited to the House of Lords by Baroness Warsi to luncheon to talk about hope and its journey and what we've achieved. And that was amazing. I took my children with me when mm. I run the AGM or any events. I try to take my children with me because they are the reason. They are the reason that mommy was supposed to have the strength to be here. I became the warrior princess because of them. And I would not be doing the things I am if it was not for them. And I want them to always see. So in my AGM, like Mustafa will hand out the little keys I gave to everybody. This is, you know, when we first set up as a kick to say thank you to everybody in the Hope team and our partners that came in, the funders that came, to say this is a key to the House of Hope, that you all have an opportunity to always be connected and always be welcome through our doors. I always say it's not a company, it's a home. Oh, and Hope is a family of people. And that's what I always say, whether you're a collaborator, a funder, or a team member, even a service user, this is always a home of Hope. And Hope itself stands for, it's an acronym of, Healing, opportunity with peace and emotion. Mm. 